Can we give another round of applause for our musicians and for Reyes? Isn't it awesome? God is good. Please be seated. A couple of things I wanted to bring up quickly is I want to thank the ladies first who showed up yesterday to fix food for the guys so we could have a men's breakfast. It seems like men can't do anything unless ladies help us out. So thank you ladies for that. And the, yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Wonderful. Hey, you know, the, the good thing about that is when I was in the kitchen, it didn't dawn on me till last night. When I was in the kitchen, I looked and there's Eliana and Bella that's helping these ladies with the meal. They're, they're serving even at a young age. When I look out at the men, we had ages from, uh, let's say, teenage years to over 90. Isn't that a blessing of God for our church, to have that in our church, to have that ability for people to share and for us to learn from one another? And guys, did Ray just knock it out of the park yesterday with his message? I mean, what a wonderful message, Ray. You, uh, you, you spoke to me. You spoke to so many of us. And we are so grateful that you're here in our church and that you're leading us. And I love when you sing because you can see that God is working in you, but you can also see how passionate he is. And he preaches a lot before I ever get up here, which is wonderful. So thank you for that. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, I had someone ask me how I go about preparing for sermons. And I was thinking about that this morning, and I'm going to apologize to those in the back because this is one of those Sundays where I have a sermon ready, but I'm probably going to go off a little bit of a tangent here just because I feel the Spirit of God moving this morning from our music, and I feel led to talk about a couple of things. But bear with me, please. So here's how I study. I, I don't look for a sermon in the can, so to speak, where somebody just searches and you find a sermon someone else has used and you use it. You learn from other pastors. I don't do that. I think that the Holy Spirit needs to work with us. The Holy Spirit needs to guide us as a church. So what I do is I sit down. I knew we we're going to go through Colossians. And on my computer, at the top of my computer, I have all the different things of Colossians I want to talk about. I've read Colossians, I've, I've broken it down to different sermons. I think I have a pretty good idea. It's about 60% done, 50 or 60% done at that point. Then I go back to the very beginning and I start studying that first sermon that we wanna give. Sometimes that first sermon ends up being two sermons. Sometimes it ends up being three, wherever God leads us. And so I go through it and I give a second, uh, second review, but this one's really in depth. And then I get it to a point that I move on to the next one. And my goal is, one of these days, I have all of them finished before we start a series and make sure that they're completely done and we're ready to go. But then the week of the sermon, after I've gone through all through Colossians, I go back to the very first week and I go through the third rendition of the sermon or third revision. And the reason I do that is because during the week, God speaks to us and God speaks to us in Bible studies on Wednesday. God speaks to us in our life. God speaks to us when I'm having conversations. And most of the time, almost all the time, that sermon changes somewhat because of what we're dealing with. Stuff that's in the news and that's how God works and I want to be prepared. I want to study. So I've got all of this and then I'm also working on a study of David. It's in real rough draft form right now. And I'm trying to figure out how to break that down. If you want to try something difficult in life, try to explain the life of David. And find out it's more difficult than I thought it was going to be. But we're going to get there because God has a plan. But as I was studying Colossians for today and for this sermon, for this sermon, I'm in the middle of it. And then I get bombarded with all kinds of stuff. I get bombarded with questions. I get bombarded with phone calls. I get bombarded with a lot of issues. And anybody that's ever worked for me or been with me in the past, Kara can tell you this. You can throw whatever you want at me, as big of an issue it is, and I'll be okay because I've always believed God will take care of me, and I feel like that was what God called me to do, was to serve and serve at a level where things happen. You have to be a leader, and God's put me in those positions. But you know what drives me crazy? Little things. Little things drive me crazy. Little things that should be taken care of that's not taken care of. Little things that should have been addressed, and all of a sudden you're having to address it. It doesn't matter whether it's church-related, home-related, whatever. And it seemed like on the day that I was working on this scripture, these scriptures, and this 
lesson, this sermon, all of a sudden, all these things hit me, all those things that irritate me. Well, that comes from Satan, doesn't it? Satan knows how to push your buttons. And so in the middle of it, my, my wife, I want to say humorously refers to it as this, but I'm not sure it's too humorous. She refers to it as my rigs fit. Sometimes I get upset and she gets it and she sees it and I get a little upset. I'm sitting in church here. I'm sitting in the back and I finally think I've just got to stop studying this study of Colossians, this sermon, and I got to work on these things that are just bombarding me. And so I, I'm hitting the computer. I'm getting upset like it's a computer's fault. I slam the computer shut. And guess what I did? I lost the entire sermon. Now, my son Caleb was in town, and he saw how upset I was by it, and he said, oh, Dad, you didn't lose it. It's on there somewhere. And he said, you know what, Dad? You found a way to lose it. And I lost the sermon. And so now my first reaction is not of humble meekness. I'm just upset. And so now I'm angry, and I'm thinking, I can't believe I did this. I've just spent hours on something, and I've lost it all. And so I go back, and as I'm thinking about it, I think, why am I so angry? Maybe if I would listen to what I'm preaching, if I would listen to what God is telling me that he can take all things for his good, if I listen and say, count it all joy, knowing these things from Satan, if I understand that sometimes that suffering, that, that adversity uh, helps us with our endurance and helps us build our character that gives us that hope in Christ that Paul talks about in Romans. If I really believe that, I'll take my lumps and I'll just dive back in tomorrow and start studying. So that's what I did. I started studying. And I thought it's going to be easy because I've already been through this. It'll just flow out. And guess what? That wasn't the case. I started seeing other things and started working on it. So now I'm on my third revision, which should be my final, but it's only my beginning. And then I get to the week and I start planning for it again. And I'm on my fourth revision. And then I get here this morning and I hear what the music says. I hear Ray yesterday in his message, and, and I started thinking, and so I thought, there's some things we need to talk about as a church. There's some things we need to talk about as human beings. There's things we need to talk about as individuals, because here's what I learned during my time when I was struggling with this sermon today, and now it's very clear why I was struggling, because as I was struggling, I was so focused on me not getting this finished, I was forgetting the phone calls I was getting, I was forgetting what people were telling me and how they were struggling their life. I was forgetting that people are dealing with medical issues. I was forgetting people are dealing with mental issues. I was forgetting people are dealing with other type of issues, financial issues, whatever it is. People are challenged by today's world, and I was forgetting that. You know why? Because Satan tries to get our mind off of what's important. And we're going through Colossians, and Colossians, what we've talked about, and we'll get to it more and more as Paul starts addressing the heresy that was entering the church at the time, and he addresses that in Colossians. One of the things that we see from Colossians is that we're supposed to keep Christ at the forefront. And so as I thought of this, and I thought about if we we're supposed to keep the cross before us at all times then I need to find our cross that's in the back we use for Easter, and I need to bring it out here so it's on our mind constantly during this study of Colossians. I'm actually thinking about moving it out in the foyer so it's on our mind as we come in, and it's on our mind as we go out into the world. Because everything we've sung about this morning, everything that we talked about this morning, points back to the cross. None of this is planned, by the way, that I'm speaking of today. If you're dealing with an issue, look at the cross. If you're dealing with dependency issues, as many are, look at the cross. If you're dealing with alcohol issues, look at the cross. If you're dealing with relationship issues, look at the cross. 
Maybe as Christians, the reason we're going through so much adversity here today in our church from the people that talk to me and the challenges, people that are coming here to find out what Jesus wants them to do in their life because they're going through so much adversity, maybe if we'd stop focusing on ourselves as I was that day and focused on the cross and what God had for us, then Satan wouldn't get in our way. Do you ever wonder why Satan's getting in our way? I've been thinking about that more and more lately because as I was going through this and hearing from people struggling, I get here on Thursday and Kara's doing some things in the kitchen for, for uh, the Saturday meeting. And all of a sudden I realize that our parking lot that we've used forever is no longer going to be able to be used. Just when we're starting to grow, I don't know if you noticed it this morning, it's been fenced off. And it looks like we're not going to be able to use it anymore. We're going to have to adapt. And instead of getting frustrated, you know what I did? For a moment I got concerned, and then I, I, I had a grin. And I'll tell you why I grinned, because when I look at the cross, I realized that, that doesn't matter. God's got a plan. And if, this, if, if we're told we can't use the back parking lot, then God will provide a parking lot. God will provide. Think about what we're, we're dealing with it. We, I mean, the funny thing is, is we talk about a possum here and everybody laughs, but the possum ran us out of this sanctuary for two weeks. Is it, we were trying to find out where it was dead and dying or where the smell was coming from. And what, what happened? We were able to overcome. And what did we hear from that? We heard from people in this church for years say, wasn't it wonderful to be so close to each other? Wasn't it wonderful to have each other? But if we're going to study Colossians and it's going to point back to the cross, we have to remember in everything in our life, we look at the cross. If we have messed up in our life royally and we're thinking God will never forgive us, oh, he will because all you got to do is look at the cross. If you're thinking I have wasted part of my life on things and, and I've thought about that in my life where I'm so focused on, on my career and I wasted those years, well, you know what? When I look at the cross, I realize forgiveness. And I realize a purpose for the future. Oh, there's a purpose. God knew you'd be right here at this time, at this place with the issues you're facing. How do you overcome it? You overcome it by looking at the cross. As Christians in this church, why is that happening to us right now? Because we're growing. And Satan's doing everything he can to take our mind off of the cross and put our mind on the things of the world. And I've seen it in people's lives in our church, and I've heard it from people in our church. Here's what I will suggest to you. In today's world, people see the world through the lens that they want to see it through. One time in America, it was a lens of right or wrong based on the cross. Whether people believe it or not, that was. There was a sense of morality. We don't have that today. Now people look at the world through the lens of being a victim. Sometimes they look at the world through the lens of being a uh, part of a, of a political party. Sometimes they look through it as a lens of an American. Sometimes they look through it as a lens of a culture or a race or a gender. And where we should be as a church is looking at everything through the lens of the cross. Everything we focus on should be focused on the cross. Now, as your pastor, I can tell you what's beautiful is that the Colossian church was, was immature and Paul was talking to them. And how do I know that? Because they were a new church. Their leader was even new. So they had some immaturity in some ways. We have a mature church in many ways, and yet we can still have issues when we fail to look at the cross. And I just feel compelled to deal one of the things that I hear as a pastor. And when people are murmuring about things, it gets back to me, by the way. I, I'll, I'll choose not to address it, and I don't think I've ever really addressed it from the pulpit, but I'm going to address this one. Didn't mean to do this this morning, but I'm going to address it. I, I hear we have grown as a church. We're a great size right now, isn't it great? Anything bigger than where we are, we kind of lose touch with each other. Find that in the Scriptures for me. Find in the Scriptures... Where God says, through his son Jesus, to go into the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then mentoring them with a focus on the cross. Where does it say we're supposed to stop?
I promise I'm going to get to Colossians 1, verses 7 and 8, maybe in a minute. I said this to my new friend Daniel the other day, and I've said this to you. If we're coasting, if we're just enjoying one another, you only coast when you're going downhill. We've had enough coasting. Not only in this church, we've had enough coasting in this nation. Here's what I challenge you to do. We have three S's we talk about all the time. We've talked about how they're biblically significant. People talk about the, what's God's will in their life. Well, part of that will is you have to work it out with God. But what we know is that there's three things that I can say beyond a shadow of the doubt that we're supposed to do. All of us. We're supposed to serve others. It's very clear in the scriptures. And we serve others best when we do it looking at the cross. We're supposed to study the scriptures. Why? Because we're looking at it as a cross because we want to be more like Jesus. Why do we share the gospel? Because we're looking at the cross and we want others to have what we have. But for us to be successful as a church, we have to be obedient. That means we have to be obedient in our life. And I'm challenging myself as well in this. When, when I sit down and Kara and I sit down and we look at our finances and we're deciding our finances, I need to look at my finances through the lens of the cross. When I'm sitting down and I'm planning vacations or I'm planning activities with my children and all of a sudden uh, I, I'm booked and I think I'm overworked and I can't get everything done, maybe I need to take a step back and say what's important and what's not important if I look at it through the lens of the cross. Because when we look through the lens of the cross, all of a sudden those things that aren't important fall away. I've talked about this before. What about relationships? So many people in relationships in the church. In improper relationships outside of the scope of marriage that God has denoted. When you look at the cross, you realize you have to get your life right. And all of a sudden, your life changes dramatically. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. But when you do that, you have that hope that other people don't have. You have a hope that you can face any obstacle that life throws at you because you are grounded in the cross. That's our challenge as a church. That's our challenge. So when people say things that sound good, but they don't match up with what the Bible says, then we have to go with what the Bible says. The cross is powerful. Now this is going to be a little, when I say it, this will be controversial to you, but let me, let me explain to you. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the most powerful thing we know, right? It doesn't just barely cover sin, it trounces sin. So we don't have to walk through life going, oh my gosh, I hope Satan doesn't. Satan's been defeated. It trounces sin. You can be forgiven of anything because of the cross. Anything because of the cross. There's one thing you can't be forgiven of. And that's if you don't accept the cross. And the world doesn't like to hear that today. But God sent his only begotten son, though whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because he's on the cross. Notice our cross is empty. Because it signifies that Jesus suffered there, but he's not there any longer. He didn't die. He was resurrected. That's the power you get in your life at your weakness, at your weakest point when Satan's come against you, you get the power of the cross in your life. I want to look at the life, my life through the lens of the cross. And when I mess up, I want to go back to the cross and ask for forgiveness, ask for help. 
But the world doesn't like to say that there's a choice between the cross and not the cross. Because if you're a Christian and you believe that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, and if you don't accept God's Son for what He did on the cross, or cross, your life and your eternal life, your eternal soul goes to hell. If you say that today, you're going to be attacked time and time again, numerous times. Are you willing to stand firm and continue to look at the cross no matter what? Paul was looking at the cross when he wrote to the Colossian church, even though he was in a Roman prison, didn't know if he'd survive or not, and yet he was still concerned about others. Why? Because he was focused on the cross. And we asked ourselves, how did Paul know how well the church was doing? How did Paul know heresy was entering the church? How did he know this when he had never been to the, visit the Colossian church. He didn't start the Colossian church. How did Paul know all these things? Let's look at chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Paul says this, Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is our faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. He has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Now, Epaphras was the gentleman that likely started the church. What is believed is that he went and traveled and saw Paul preaching and then took that preaching back to uh, Colossae and then preached the gospel and formed the church, and the church was growing. And remember what we said last week. Early in chapter 1, it talks about Paul was, was commending them on their faith, love, and their hope. I mean, that's something to be commended on by an apostle of God to say, hey, First Baptist Church, I commend you because of the faith you have in the cross, the love you have because of the cross, the hope you have because of the cross. We talked about the more familiar verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 13 that talks about faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these love. And the reason we said the greatest was love is that our faith will end inside of Jesus. Our hope, our, our assurance that we're going to heaven will end when we, we see Jesus and we see God. But that love lasts forever because of the cross. And Paul commends them on this. And because of Epaphras going to him, he knows what they're doing well, and he knows what they're not doing so well. And what he said, I think there's two great lessons for us in our church. I think there's two great lessons for us as individuals. If you're, if you're, a, if you're a mother, if you're a father, if you're a grandparent, if you work with youth, if you're on the missionary field, whatever, I think there's two great lessons. One, when you have to have a tough conversation with someone... It's okay to start out at times with having, talking about what they're doing well as a church, as individuals. It's a good way to get to the topic that God has for you to talk to them. The second, the second thing that I think we've learned here is when you need help, go to someone for spiritual guidance and help. So we talked about why do I think the church was immature? Because it was a new church. Their leader was new. And their leader, I believe, went all the way back to see Paul in prison so he could get advice from an apostle of God because of all these things that the church was being bombarded with. We're being bombarded with a few things, right? We're doing some great things we've talked about in this church, and then all of a sudden we have some issues individually, collectively as a church. But think about what the Colossian church was going through. Satan was trying to snuff it out. Satan was trying to wipe that whole region out, and he was starting there at the church, uh, the Colossian church, and Epaphras felt like, I'm over my head. I need to go talk to an apostle of God, and he gets advice, and then Paul writes this letter because of what he's heard. What a, what a wonderful story. You know, here's, here's what I'll say. We need, as a church, to continue to grow. We need as a church to continue to mentor. Next week, we have four young people getting baptized. Amen. Next week, right here. We have a deacon being ordained right here next week. God is doing some great things. But our responsibility, 
of our new deacon and responsibility of our deacon body and the responsibility of this church is for, for those four young people, when we baptize them, because they've been saved and been baptized, our responsibility doesn't end there. Our responsibility continues because we are called to mentor them and lead them. And I will tell you, to be involved in church, look at the scripture, study everything according to what's based on the cross. Be careful of preachers you listen to online. Be careful of preachers you see on TV. Not, there's some great preachers. I listen to a lot of them. But sometimes I find one that's not following the cross, and I have to rightly divide the word of truth, as we talked about last week. That's your responsibility. I've heard people say, I have... You know, spiritual advisors, spiritual this. I, I've seen people go to psychics, whatever that is. Here's what I will tell you. If you've got somebody that's, that's helping you along the way, you don't need an advisor. You need a mentor. You need somebody that teaches you the Word of God. Someone that's going to walk alongside of you each and every day. Not someone that's outside the church not going to church. Not someone that's a one-issue person. I deal with people all the time that's one issue. You know what you need? You need somebody that understands the scripture and they're living that life. They're living that life. They're looking through the lens of the cross and everything it is. And Epaphras went to Paul because he knew he was an apostle of God. What a wonderful thing. I look around here and I, I see these great men and women of faith. And I think, boy, when, when, when there's challenges here, sometimes I just talk to them. And they're just such an encouragement, and they have a word of advice. One of the darkest times of my life was we had a young lady that committed suicide that our family knew, had been to our house, 18 years of age. I bring this up today because we talk about a pandemic. We have more of an issue with suicides across this nation than probably anything else right now. And it's because people have lost hope because they either don't know about the cross or they have forgotten about the cross. And you're talking about an 18-year-old young lady, lovely people, loved her, had a great personality, and she got involved in something that was completely against her beliefs as a young lady, as a Christian young lady, and she didn't feel like there was hope because why? She forgot to look at the cross and realize that forgiveness was there. And I didn't know how to handle it because I was asked to lead the funeral service. And I didn't know how to handle it because I knew there would be all these hundreds of kids from school our Christian school that were there. And I didn't know what to do. And it just so happened in God's great providence and his great care, he put me in Corpus Christi, Texas uh, it, during a visit. And I found myself sitting across two ministers and one was an individual been a minister for decades. Had helped lead numerous people to Christ, had built churches. And I asked him, and I was just honest, much like I think Epaphras is, I just said, hey, I'm in over my head. I don't know what to say. And he gave me wisdom according to scriptures, according to what he had been through that allowed me to not only get through that day, but to offer hope and encouragement because of the cross. That's the importance of having us gather together. That's the importance of having your children here learning the word of God. That's the importance. Because someday when they're an adult, they're going to be in a situation, and are they going to know to look at the cross? Let's look at verse, verses 10 and 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you be filled with knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing in Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. I mean, think about this. When somebody tells you that they are praying for you, and you know they mean it, they're a Christian, they're a Christian brother and sister, they have lived their life through the cross, don't take that for granted. That is a blessing from God. And you know how you get that blessing? When you're actively engaged in church. When you're busy about God's business. Right? That's how we, that's how we gather that. We have great prayer warriors in this church. Great prayer warriors in this church. 
And here the apostle of God is telling the Colossians, I've been praying for you. I've been praying praying for you. And he gives some specific prayers. He gives a specific prayer because when you look at the prayer, knowing that he's dealing with heresy, some of the things we've talked about in the, in the past couple of weeks, the Gnostics and the Jewish tradition and the uh, asceticism that was going on and all the other uh, things from the gods and goddesses that had infiltrated culture at a time. And he knew they were being bombarded with all this, much like we're being bombarded with everything in America today. Uh, Paul said this prayer. So I think we need to break this prayer down and, and look, look at it a little bit more closely. Let me, there's five parts to his prayer at this point. There's more to this prayer in a moment, but there's five parts to this prayer that I want to go over. First, he tells, he says that he wants you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. That's spiritual wisdom. That's spiritual wisdom in God's will according to the cross. That's God's will. He wants us to walk in a manner worthy of identifying with Christ. To demonstrate basically to others a calling in our life of Jesus because of the cross. When people see us, I think what Paul's saying is when people see you, and they see you during the day, they see you at work, they see you at the grocery store, do they see Jesus in you? There are people I've met and I've never had a conversation with them about Christ. I've just met somewhere or I've seen them later and I've watched their interactions and I know in my spirit that they're a Christian just by the way they conduct themselves. Have you seen that before? You know that because they're different. Christians are different. Ver, uh, number three says to walk in a manner pleasing to God. To walk in a manner pleasing to God. That means your yes is yes, as the Bible says, and your no is no. You're either for God or you're against God. You're either looking through the lens of the cross or you're looking through the lens of the world. Paul's praying for this for them. To bear every good work. To bear fruit in every good work. There's outcomes. And the last one is to increase in the knowledge of of God, the general knowledge of who God is. Now, now think about these five. I want you to look on here and look at the very first one, knowledge of God's will, and the last one to increase the knowledge of God. Here's what I'll tell you. You can't do two, three, or four unless you're doing one and five. Because if you don't know God's will for your life, if you're not completely engaged in Bible study and learning about God, how in the world do you hope to walk in a manner identifying with Christ? How do you walk in a way pleasing to God? How do you bear fruit if you don't know God's will for your life and you don't know the knowledge that's in the Scriptures? You can't do it. And that's why Paul's telling him, you have to do this. Why is Paul saying this? Because in the back of his mind, he knows they're dealing with heresy. And how do you... How do you get rid of heresy in a church? How do you get rid of heresy in a culture? You study God's Word. And as powerful as God's Word is, only 9% of Christians open the Bible and study God's Word. That's why we're so focused on studying God's Word here at our church. For those in the back, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm skipping a few things on slides, so just bear with me. I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about number four, to bear fruit. To bear fruit. If we are living a life according to God, we're going to bear fruit. If we're, I want you to listen to this. I'm not trying to be angry with anybody. I'm just sharing the truth. If we are bearing fruit as a church, we're going to grow. Now, that, that could be numbers, but that could also be service. That could also be the things we do on outreach, right? Because sometimes people just decide they're not going to go to church, and that's their decision. They have to make that decision. But we're going to be successful because we're going to be obedient. But I still think one of the signs is all the service that we do, how people show up to do that service, and we have been doing well there, and I am so appreciative. And now we have more ideas than we have people. So... Either we get some more people in here to help and, and God expands that, but how do we do that? By following the cross. We're not worried about a parking lot. We're not worried about money. We're not worried about people. If God is in it, he will provide. We just have to be obedient. Amen. I went to a church one time that said, 
we, they just built this beautiful church. They were on this corner of all these traffic. And the preacher actually said, we're doing real well. We got people. But sometime that's going to stop because people are just going to stop coming. We're getting people because of where we're located. And I thought, I don't want to go to church here. I want to go to church that's actively engaged. We're not going to be, we're not going to remain stagnant because we are called to bear fruit. Now, there's a couple ways we can bear fruit. I, I love my upbringing. We didn't have a lot of money, but I had love and family and, and, and just a, a beautiful upbringing. But one of the things we did have that others didn't, and in my backyard is I had a grapevine, I had a cherry tree, and when it was ripe, I'd go out there and eat. The next door neighbors had an apple tree, didn't eat those too many times because there were a lot of worms and apples, so I kind of stayed away from those. But there were berries all through the neighborhoods, an old neighborhood. And I would ride my bike and see a berry tree, and I knew which ones I could eat. And boy, when they were in bloom, I would just sit there and eat like crazy because it was so good, because it was bearing good fruit. But my mom, when she saw me like eating a cherry and that, she at a very young age, she took me in the backyard. We had a small backyard, but all these shrubs and bushes. And she showed me plants that had a beautiful fruit. But she said, don't eat that. It'll make you sick. You know, there's one, there's one fruit that I did research on one time. It's a tree, and if you actually eat it, you die. And it's so poisonous, if you sit under it and it rains, the warning sign is, uh, do not stand beneath tree when it's raining. Because the fruit, when it hits, it comes down and it makes you sick. Just that, that's bad fruit. So what Paul is saying, we want to have good fruit in our life because of the cross of Christ. A decision to follow Christ and follow His will, to look at life through the lens of the cross, will bear good fruit. That means we'll have almost 40 men for a breakfast. That means we have women, I think it's like, I, how many, Priscilla, for 25 women that are going to start a Bible study for women pretty soon. David Winston has over 12 every week, it seems like now, for Bible study on Thursday nights. We have special events where we're going to invite people in. We're bearing fruit. So a decision to serve God bears fruit. bears fruit for individuals, and it bears fruit for the church. But indecision, indecision is a decision not to follow Christ. You can, you can decide I'm not following Christ, and you can also decide, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to church this week, or I don't know if I want to do this, or I, I want to go, but I don't really want to get involved. That's indecision, and that won't bear fruit. And God in His forbearance may still bless you. God in His great forbearance will still help you. He will still call you in. But there comes a time that we're all going to meet our Maker. There comes a time, as the Bible says, appointed for all of us to die. And at that time, are we looking at eternity through the lens of the cross? Or do we find ourselves hopeless without the cross? That's the importance of us bearing fruit. That's the importance of us making the decision to bear fruit. I love, I love this prayer of Paul. Let's look at verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious mind for all endurance, fortitude, and patience with joy. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance, which is fortitude, and patience with joy. No matter what we face, we can face it and be patient and just face it with joy because God has found us worthy to deal with that situation that we're dealing with. And when things are going well, praise God and keep bearing fruit. If God has put more money in your bank account, the first thing you should think about is how do I bless God? How do I bless others? By looking how I spend my money according to the cross, or do we think about the things of the world? I'll give you an example of a young lady that worked for me. She ran the office for public safety for all of the city of Indianapolis. We had 85% of the entire city budget, and I had to have someone that ran the office that I could trust. And I found a young lady in the fire department that was amazing at what she did, and I could tell by the way she acted that she was a Christian, and we brought her into the job. We were having trouble in that position, and she came in and brought calm and peace to it, and she changed the office dynamics because she looked at everything through the lens of Christ. 
She may not be outwardly promoting it at work. She may not be preaching it. She didn't mind to say, God bless you and those things, but you could tell there was something different about her. And one day, when all the staff was gathered around, and I could hear them talking outside, the lady that a lot of people just don't pay attention to walking in, they're all, they're, they're all sitting and talking, and she's in the middle, and they're having this conversation about if they won the lottery. The Powerball was like, I don't know how many hundred millions. And I know if you're thinking, I can't believe he's talking about the Powerball at church. I'm not a fan of the Powerball. I've never played it in my life, and I won't, for a lot of reasons we won't get into today. But they were having this conversation. Don't miss the point of the conversation. And they're having this conversation. They're saying, what would you do if you had that kind of money? And everybody around the room, all these leaders in the city of Indianapolis were talking about what they would do with the money. If they, and every one of them said they were going to quit. Every one of them. And then I walked in, and they said, Troy, if you won the Powerball, and I said, that's not going to happen because I don't play the Powerball. I, I think it's gambling. I think it's coveting. I'm not going to do it. And they said, okay, well, what happens if somebody just gave you $100 million? What would you do? And I thought, man, $100 million, I, you know, I'm take care of my parents, take care of Kara's family, I'd do this, I'd do that, I, you know, I'd buy that car that I always wanted. I'm starting to think, you know, and we're just having a good time. Lori, hope she doesn't mind me using her name, Lori, when they looked at Lori, said, Lori, what would you do with $100 million? And she said, I want you to think about this. Think about all the people you could help. I'm running out of time. Let me go ahead and call the deacons up. Um, and their wives to come forward. Andrew, would you come forward? Would you come here with me for a second? I just feel led to do something. Uh, For those young people that are getting baptized, where are you? Would you all stand up for me? Isn't this a wonderful day? Uh, Isn't this a wonderful day? As they stand, before we open the altar for anyone else, as they stand, I'm going to ask Andrea to pray for them that their lives would be blessed. That all through their life that they look at the cross. Go ahead, Andrea. Holy Heavenly Father, um, I come to you on behalf of those who will be baptized next week and lift each of them up to you, Lord. You know them by name. You know what is going on in their hearts and their lives and their understanding about you. And uh, Father, you've touched them in a, in a way that has led them to, to this decision. Um, they want to be obedient in following you in baptism. And the example you set for us, and we want to follow that after we have come to the knowledge of of you and have placed our trust in you with our lives and our our futures and all that we are and we have submitted to you and the natural result from that is to to want to obey you for the rest of our lives and uh, the first step is uh, is following you in baptism so please help them to approach this act of worship with with reverence and to feel the weight of, of what it means. Help them to, to go into it with joy and um, in awe, really, of what you have done in their lives and what you'll continue to do 
and that you would just receive glory for this and take their lives and their offering um, to you and, and mold them in the way you would have them to, to be shaped and to worship and serve you, Lord. Um, protect them, Father, from any opposition or obstacles that would be in the way of, of this um, event next week. Um, and just surround them with your presence for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 as we go next week. Also, Jeremy, as a, a deacon candidate, we have our business meeting afterwards, but be prayer. Uh, I want to talk about God blessing us and how we're bearing fruit just one final time. Is that uh, I was, I was uh, met Kevin this morning. We were talking about when I first got here, and you all have heard the story. There were 15 people here on a Sunday morning. I was just an interim pastor. is my first Sunday, and all 15 were sitting in the back. I thought I needed to walk down there and talk. It's pretty empty. And today, today, God has given us 102 people here. Amen. Can we just give God the glory? I don't know what you're going through today, but the God that saved this church is here for you. The God that restored this church can restore you. The altar is open. We have our deacons here and their wives to pray for you. If you'd just like to come and say a prayer by yourself, that is fine. If you'd like to come and just praise God, that's wonderful. The altar is open. 